We're going to talk briefly about ocular hypertension and glaucoma suspects. By definition, individuals are considered to have glaucoma if they have characteristic optic nerve head changes with or without visual field loss. And most of these patients will also have an elevated intraocular pressure. This section deals with patients who have features of glaucoma, but not enough features to call them glaucoma patients. So this will be people with ocular hypertension, suspicious optic nerves, or a strong family history of glaucoma. The average intraocular pressure is around 16 millimeters of mercury, 15 and a half. And if one assumes a Gaussian or bell-shaped distribution with plus or minus two standard deviations, we would have a normal pressure range of 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. But intraocular pressure does not strictly follow a bell-shaped curve. So this is what we might imagine the bell-shaped curve would look like with the peak at 15 and a half plus or minus two standard deviations would give us this 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. But in reality, the curve is skewed to the right. There are very few people who have pressures under 10 who have not had glaucoma surgery. And 10% of the population is here above 21 millimeters of mercury. So we call those people ocular hypertensives. They don't have glaucoma necessarily but they have pressures outside the average range. And that includes 10% of adults over 40 have pressures over 21 millimeters of mercury. We call them uh, patients with ocular hypertension. And the question is, do we treat these people? That's a lot of people, 10% of the population. Well, thankfully, the ocular hypertension treatment study was designed to answer that very question. And throughout this lecture series, whenever I talk about a, a randomized controlled trial, I will put these RCTs down the side because really in a lot of ways, the real truth of what we know comes from randomized controlled trials. And so I think we take these data with more uh, authority than we take data from smaller, less controlled studies. So that'll carry through all the lectures here. The question is, does treating ocular hypertension prevent or delay the development of glaucoma? This is a multi-center trial, lots of individuals in this, 1,600 patients randomized to no treatment or treatment. With the goal of bringing the pressure below 24 millimeters of mercury and lowering it by at least 20%. The answer to that question is at five years, there was progression from ocular hypertension to glaucoma in 9.5% of controls versus 4.4% of treated, roughly twice as many. That's a 50% reduction in the number of people who went from ocular hypertension to glaucoma, very st statistically significant. But another way of looking at this is that 90% of patients with ocular hypertension did not convert in five years. The things that put people at risk for conversion were being older, the height of the intraocular pressure, having a thin central corneal thickness, having a large cup to disc ratio, or a disc hemorrhage. And while corneal thickness has been talked about for years, dating back to Goldman when he invented the tenometer, it's really the Oates study that cemented in our clinical practice the importance of the central corneal thickness. There's an 81% increase in risk for every 40 microns thinner that the cornea is, and so central corneal thickness is a very important risk factor. African American patients on average had thinner corneas, and larger cup to disc ratios. And when we correct for those, for corneal thickness and cup to disc ratio, race itself disappeared as a risk factor. So race was a risk factor in that people of African heritage were more likely to have thin corneas and more likely to have baseline larger cup to disc ratios. 
they found that a delay in treatment did not hurt the prognosis for patients who are ocular hypertensive. So if we started the therapy later, they still seem to do as well. 84% of disc hemorrhages were seen on photos, but not clinical exam. Really kind of a startling number to me that really experienced examiners would look at optic nerves and not see a disc hemorrhage, but they would be discovered later on photos. It showed the limited utility of monocular trials in prostaglandin analogs. So people have been questioning whether one-eye trials really made a lot of sense for a while, but in the OAT study, it pretty well showed that doing serial pressures before and after change in therapy was a better way of evaluating the medical of the effect of that medicine than doing one-eye trials. So I personally have, with great pain, abandoned one-eye trials. Cataract formation was more common in the group that was treated. And another finding that has come out of many studies but was really solidified by the OATS is that when phacoemulsification is done in these patients, now remember these are patients with ocular hypertension but not glaucoma, there is a significant drop in intraocular pressure. On average, 4.1 millimeters of mercury or about 16.5%. And this remained lower than pre-op for 36 months. The OATS has developed a risk calculator, so one can take features of the patient that you're evaluating, plug them into the risk calculator, and it'll give an idea of what the uh, risk of developing glaucoma would be. And they use data not only from OATS, but also from the European Glaucoma Prevention Study. So the website address is there at the top. One plugs in the age, central corneal thickness, vertical cup to disc ratio, and pattern standard deviation on Humphrey or the corrected loss variance on Octopus. And this is what it looks like. And so you can see that this 55-year-old patient with uh, pressures as high as 28 millimeters of mercury, sort of average corneal thicknesses, small cup to disc ratio, pretty normal visual fields, has a 16.9% five-year risk of developing early glaucoma in at least one eye. Besides ocular hypertension, there are other glaucoma suspect patients, patients whose nerves look glaucomatous. But if we've never seen them before, we're really not sure that the nerves haven't always looked like this. So we're all born with nerves that are different, and one can have a very large cup to disc ratio or a very small cup to disc ratio at baseline, and it's really hard to know unless you've seen the patient before. If the pressure in the fields are normal, then these patients are typically photographed and then followed as glaucoma suspects. This is a patient of mine I've been following since 1996. Very large cup to disc ratios, but the rims are intact. He may be the only patient on whom I do swap perimetry because he's really good at it and because I've been doing it for years and years and years. But his fields are normal. And now that OCT is available, we can see that despite having a very large uh, cup, he also has a very large disc, and the average nerve fiber layer thickness is normal. Um, everything else looks normal. So this is a person with a large cup to disc ratio based on the fact that he has a very, very large disc. Rim area is normal despite the size of the cup. Lastly, family history. You know, there are some patients who have very strong family histories of glaucoma. We certainly see this in people with myosillin, juvenile onset glaucoma. But if we look at adult primary open angle glaucoma, the Rotterdam study found that the prevalence of glaucoma in siblings of patients was 10.4% versus 0.7% when um, in the siblings of the controls. So 15 fold increase in risk. The Beaver Dam study also found a strong effect of family history on the risk of glaucoma. 
and they found a strong correlation for pressure and vertical cup to dish ratio between first degree relatives and a lack of correlation if they used a spouse as a control. So family history, what, what does one do if a patient has family history? I think you would want to alert whoever is doing their eye care that there's a family history of glaucoma, so hopefully they pay more attention to the optic nerve than they might otherwise. I think if I see somebody in my clinic who has a family history, a, a relative who I'm caring for, I will often get disc photos because 15 or 20 years from now, that could be critical. There are certainly other things that we see that would put people at risk for glaucoma that are subjects of other talks, pigment dispersion, exfoliation, angle recession, narrow angles. So just an overview of people who are at risk for glaucoma but don't have glaucoma and uh, an approach to how to think of them.